Yeah, so uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to all members of NEMI, the Geological Society of London, and the Paleontological Association. But uh, foremost, to Steve Brissac for agreeing to present tonight's lecture. I shall pass you on now to our Honorary Secretary, uh, Andrew Dubransky, for our Council report. Andrew? Lovely. So a very good evening to you all. Uh, it's fantastic to see such a great turnout for what I'm sure will be a very fascinating and entertaining talk indeed. Um, so just uh, a few things, uh, given, given we've got such a large audience, uh, there's just a few notices to get through. Uh, first of all, um, we, our last talk was a great success. It was about inland jet mining in the North York Moors. We had a wonderful attendance, which I think this one has just smashed. Um, and we had some excellent questions, particularly from Sarah Steele, who's a uh, jet ex expert based in Whitby. Um, the closing remarks, a excellent vote of thanks by David Granger and Rick Smith. So if the officers are happy with that report. Just, uh, we, we do, as an institute, do have a lot of talks on. We uh, try and have them monthly, apart from a, a breakout uh, during the summer. Our next talk is going to be a really interesting talk given by our, uh, our very own David Bell on the geology, and mining and narrow gauge railways of uh, New Zealand. So just make it, uh, um, and I'll give you a few notices on how you can find out more about that in a moment. And our next February talk, uh, which is already lined up, is a really interesting talk on geotechnics. And uh, this is given by Dr. Hannah Hughes, who is one of the foremost academic uh, economic geologists in the country, based down at Campbell School of Mines. It's going to be a, Hannah's an excellent speaker, and it's going to be a brilliant talk. So if you're interested in why certain, certain rocks might uh, suddenly go bang when you're underground, uh, do, do come along to that one as well. So how can you find out more about us? Well, don't forget, uh, for more great talks, we do every, we, we are the uh, Mining Institute of Mining and Mechanical Engineers, but we're not just mining or mechanical engineering. Uh, uh, tonight we've got paleontology, uh, but we do all, all sorts of the natural, physical and material sciences talks as well. So if you want to find out more, do make sure you're, you like, share and subscribe to our YouTube. Or we're also on Twitter. Uh, many of you would find us on Facebook. Uh, and for, the, for our professional events, we post them on LinkedIn as well. And if you want more information about us, do go to our website. Uh, we've got a range uh, of activities on as an institute. Uh, you, you were at one of our excellent talks. Uh, we've got two conferences coming up next year. One. Uh, on sustainable mining and another one on the energy transition for the north uh, in partnership with the Durham Energy Institute. So uh, do make sure that you sign up to uh, regular updates to find out more about that. Uh, if you become a member, you'll get to meet uh, a wide range of people either at our professional events uh, or at our annual dinner, uh, which there's a, a wide range of uh, men and women of lots of different professional backgrounds uh, that you can come and talk to. And we also put on some great field trips. Um, so far we've been to the Pennines, we, we've got some international field trips planned. And if anyone's interested in perhaps organizing a paleontological field trip as well, please do get in touch. Um, our, the best way to support us uh, is of course through membership. So uh, it, it, the higher grades, you can even get some excellent and prestigious letters, the M NEMI and F NEMI um, post nominals. Uh, you also get invocations to our guest lecture series and CPD events, discounts on uh, field trips and our excellent publications. We've got an annual dinner, we've got sporting events, uh, and also we are we do have a number of roles uh, that people might be interested in volunteering to fill at the Institute, uh, from publications to uh, to events. So if you're interested, don't forget to sign up at uh, moneyinstitute.org.uk forward slash membership and get in touch if you want to be involved more. So that's all my notices, and uh, I'll hand back, hand back to Steve and we can get to the talk proper. So thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. You'd make an absolute uh, excellent salesman. That was a, a good line. Thank you very much indeed. Um, but now I'm going to pass you on to uh, Leslie Dunlop of the Geological Society of London. Leslie, would you like to give us an address?
what are we doing? Sure. Um, Leslie, I've asked you to unmute. I can't see you. That's it. Right, okay, thanks. Um, Thank you, Hi there. Um, just wanted to say good evening. I'm here representing, as Steve said, the Geological Society of London. I'm also chair of the Northern Regional Group of the JOLSOC and a former council member and part of their Geoconservation Committee. Um, like everyone, we have a, a range of lectures as well. We have a, a lecture coming up in second week of December on radioactive waste. Information can be found on the Geological Society's website. What I really want to do tonight is just put to tonight's talk into a context for the Geological Society because this year, 2020, I'm not sure it was a wise choice in the pandemic reign, is the year of life. Um, and I'd really like to thank Steve, our speaker, for agreeing to talk about the rise and fall of dinosaurs and linking this to our 2020 year of life. Because as we know, it's the origin of life and extinctions and all of the other things that cause it are, are something that the public and everyone is fascinated in. And usually there's no easy answer. So it'd be really nice to see what, um, Steve's got to say about the rise and fall of the dinosaurs and the extinctions within that. I'd also like to say thank you to the Northern Northeastern Institute of Mining and Mechanical Engineers and to the Paleontological Association for co-hosting this, because I think these co-hosted lectures are, are really important for building links between different societies. We can exist in silos otherwise. So I'll hand you back to Steve now and just say welcome and thank you for coming along tonight. Right, well, thank you very, very much, Leslie. That was, that was excellent. Uh, um, and no doubt you're just as good a salesman as Andrew. <laughs> so, but uh, for now, uh, I'd like to pass you on uh, for a word from Fiona Gill of the Paleontological Association, which I'm sure she's got something interesting to tell us too. Fiona? Yeah, okay. Uh, can you, sorry, I thought I'd be, I was expecting to see myself on the screen. Sorry about that. Um, well, I'm very happy to be representing the Paleontological Association tonight for what I'm sure will be a fascinating lecture by Steve. The Paleontological Association, otherwise known as the PALAS, was founded in 1957, and in the 60 or so years since then, it's expanded from a small London-centric organisation to become one of the world's leading learned societies in this field, with well over a thousand members from at least 53 different countries. And we hope that there are many PALAS members in the audience tonight. The association is a registered charity that promotes the study of paleontology and related sciences through a diverse program of activity, including our annual awards. In fact, tonight's speaker was a recipient of the 2017 Hodgson Award, which is the association's award conferred on a paleontologist who has made a notable contribution to the subject at an early career stage. And I think this shows how highly Steve is regarded by the association. The Paleontological Association is very pleased to support the Geological Society in their Year of Life initiative. Many of the joint events that were suggested for this year have sadly been disrupted by COVID, but we're delighted that this one has been able to go ahead thanks to the Mining Institute. And I'm sure it will be an excellent and enjoyable talk from Steve. So I'm back now to, to Steve. Well, thank you very much, Fiona. And it was wonderful to hear a little about your society, which uh, I look forward to seeing more of you in future. So take care. Thank you. Uh, right. So uh, now I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our speaker for tonight. And uh, our speaker, of course, as you know, is Steve Brissat. And uh, he's a paleontologist who hunts and writes about dinosaurs. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Edinburgh, but grew up in the Midwestern USA. 
uh, Steve has traveled around the world digging up dinosaurs uh, and working with many international colleagues. Um, his name has more than 15 species, named more than 15 new species, uh, of which I'm not going to name them myself because uh, I'll make a, a mess of that, I'm sure. Um, he's written several books for kids and adults, most notably the adult pop science book, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs in uh, 2018, which was a New York Times bestseller in the USA, uh, a Sunday Times bestseller in the UK, and uh, Globe and Mail bestseller in Canada. Uh, his work's often covered by the popular press, and he's appeared on several television shows, such as uh, the National Geographic Extravaganza, T-Rex Autops Autopsy, uh, where he was part of the team that dissected a scientifically accurate life-size model of T-Rex. So we're going to have a, an interesting talk tonight, so uh, I'm not going to go any further with that, and uh, I'm pleased to hand you over now to, uh, to Steve Brissett. Steve, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you very much to the Institute of Mining, to Palas, uh, to the Geological Society for putting this together. Um, and I'm really pleased I can do this. I'm really pleased that um, it looks like we have a nice crowd of people from all over the world joining in, which is a great thing because uh, at least in the pre-pandemic days, uh, although the pre-pandemic days were much better in almost every regard, one of the things that's better now in a sense is that we can do these things and bring things online and, and reach out to a much wider group of people. So I'm very pleased that, that uh, you're joining us this evening, at least this evening, uh, UK time for those of us who are over here and uh, for those who may be back home in the US, you know, good afternoon to you all. Okay, so, okay, rather than small talk, um, I want to tell the story of dinosaurs here, and there's there's a, a long history of dinosaurs. We're talking about over 200 million years of evolution, uh, and I want to do this in 40-ish minutes so we have enough time for questions. So I'm going to jump right into it. I'm going to start sharing my screen here uh, in a second. So let me do this first. All right, and hopefully you can see the slides. Does this look good for everybody? Okay, great. Okay, so the rise and fall of the dinosaurs. That's the story I want to tell you today. Uh, I'm one of those fortunate people that gets to dig up dinosaurs and study fossils for my job. I'm a paleontologist and I'm based here at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. It's a long way from home. I grew up around the Chicago area, but I found my way here and uh, I really couldn't be luckier because Edinburgh has such a long legacy in the earth sciences and in the evolutionary sciences. The, the science of geology was invented here. Many of the world's most famous fossil sites are right here in Scotland. Uh, so it's a real privilege and pleasure to work here. And uh, since the time I've been here, we've built up our paleontology group and we have what I think is a really nice, diverse, international group of people, of students, of postdocs, of faculty, that are working on all sorts of interesting questions in evolution. And uh, we have a master's course, a one-year master's course for any of you that might be interested for uh, that bridge between undergrad and PhD. So please do get in touch if you're interested in studying with us. That's my Edinburgh pitch. But again, I don't want to take too much time from the dinosaurs because I want to tell their story today. And it's the story that uh, I tried to tell uh, in this book uh, that was mentioned that I wrote a few years ago. And this is the UK cover for those of you back home in the US. There's a different cover with a bunch of dinosaurs, not just one blood red T-Rex. Uh, but uh, this book is it, its actually a little bit out of date now. It's a few years old. And as you'll see, we're learning so many new things about dinosaurs that so many new species, so many new discoveries has been made, have been made since the book came out. But by and large, what I do in the book, what I'm gonna try to do here is tell you that grand story of dinosaurs, where they came from, how they rose up and became dominant, how some of them grew to huge sizes, how others grew feathers and wings and became birds, and how the rest of them went extinct. So let's start the story. And the story begins here. This is the setting for the rise of the dinosaurs. This is what the world looked like about 250 million years ago at the end of the Permian period. This was before there was any dinosaurs. The dinosaurs were still to come. 
And as you can obviously see, this world is so different from our world today. This was the time of Pangaea, the single supercontinent that was formed from all of the world's land globbed together. It stretched from North Pole to South Pole. And this was a pretty harsh world. If you were in the interior of Pangaea, you might be 10,000 miles from the closest ocean. There were no ice caps at this time. It was hot, it was humid, it was dry in many places in Pangaea. Big desert stretched across much of the supercontinent. But as always, there were plenty of plants and animals that were adapted to that world, including many of the ancestors of us, many of the early uh, mammal relatives, along with giant amphibians and various reptiles and all kinds of things. But that world was thrown into chaos about 250 million years ago as the Permian period ended, and it ended with an extinction. And not just any extinction, but the biggest, most terrible mass extinction that's ever happened in the history of the world, where 90, maybe even 95% of all species died out. And the culprit, volcanoes, but not just any volcanoes, not the sort of volcanoes we're used to, not the kind of volcanoes you see, you know, spewing out uh, lava on Hawaii today or releasing clouds of ash like Pinatubo or Mount St. Helens. These volcanoes at the end of the Permian were mega volcanoes, and they were located in what is now Siberia. And for millions of years, essentially the earth opened up. It's like the earth was gashed open by a giant machete and lava was constantly flowing out of these wounds. And there was so much lava that it covered an area that at least was equivalent in, in area to all of Western Europe today. That's a huge amount of space that was drowned in lava. But it wasn't even the lava that was the biggest problem. It was all the nasty gases that came up from the deep earth as the lava percolated upwards from the mantle and cooked the rocks that it passed through carbon dioxide, methane, these toxic greenhouse gases that, as we know from what's happening today, they warmed the planet, led to a runaway global warming event, and that caused the extinction. And this was the closest that life has ever come to completely dying out ever since life originated four billion years ago. But there were survivors. There's always survivors. At least so far, there have always been survivors. The Earth is resilient. And from those survivors, an entirely new world was forged. Now, when I was a student studying in Bristol, I did my master's in Bristol with Mike Benton, and I started to work on the Triassic, the period that came after the Permian, the recovery from that extinction. And I became fascinated with what lived and what died and how long it took for things to recover and to heal. And I started to look for places where we could find fossils to tell that story. And I teamed up with Richard Butler, who's now a professor in Birmingham. And for a few years, we hopped all around Europe, uh, looking basically at any Triassic rock that we could find. And our journey took us to Poland, which is one of the best places in the world to study what happened across that extinction. Because although you may not suspect that Poland is the kind of place that may have a lot of fossils, because it does not fit that stereotype that we see of paleontologists on the Discovery Channel brushing bones, uh, sand off of the dinosaur bones in the desert and so on. That's not Poland. But there's lots of fossils in Poland. There's layer after layer of Permian and Triassic rocks. And those rock layers have fossils inside. And they're mined for clay to make bricks in many places. So we can go to these quarries and look layer after layer. Read those layers like the pages in a book to tell the story of the extinction and the recovery. Now the fossils in Poland, which have been studied for many years by our good friend Gregor Snitzvicki here, who grew up in this part of central Poland called the Holy Cross Mountain, started collecting these fossils when he was a teenager. These fossils are not skeletons. They're not, for the most part, bones and teeth, but they are trace fossils. They are footprints and handprints the marks that the animals living in the Permian and later in the Triassic left behind. And just one or two million years after the extinction, we start to see these tracks appear in the Polish record. And what we have here is a handprint right here, the smaller handprint and a bigger footprint. Very small, just a few centimeters long, about the size of a cat's paw print. And they were made by an animal that looked like this. 
believe it or not, this is the type of animals that dinosaurs evolved from. It is what we call a dinosauromorph, and it's basically the dinosaur equivalent of Lucy, the famous hominid skeleton. Lucy is not a Homo sapiens like us, but it's a really, really, really close relative. It's the type of, of primate that humans evolved from, and this is the dinosaur equivalent. It is from this type of small, long-legged, fast-running reptile that dinosaurs erodes. And it, this thing doesn't look anything like a T-Rex. It doesn't look anything like a brontosaurus, but from small things, of course, great things sometimes come. And that was the story of dinosaur evolution in the Triassic period. Now, the Triassic, the first several tens of millions of years of dinosaur evolution was not a time of dinosaur dominance. The dinosaurs did not rapidly spread around the world and take it over. That did not happen. Instead, there were other animals that ruled the Triassic world. And we found some of these in Portugal. Richard and I worked in Portugal with Octavio Mateus, who's a great uh, expert of Portuguese fossils. He started collecting when he was a teenager too. His parents were uh, local amateur historians and archeologists. They started their own museum in Lourinha in Portugal. And Richard and Octavio and I teamed up with people like Jessica Whiteside, who's a very skilled geologist. And we looked in the Triassic Age rocks of the Algar, just about 20 miles inland from those beaches that were full of British tourists. But we were inland. It was, it was hot. It was dry. <laughs> Much more like that stereotype of finding fossils. Now, we hoped we would find dinosaurs. We still haven't found dinosaurs there. Maybe we'll find them one day. We probably haven't found them yet because they were still quite rare and small in the Triassic. It's hard to find their fossils, but instead we found a graveyard, a bone bed, of what looks to be dozens or probably even hundreds of skeletons of these type of things, which are these monstrous, grotesque, car-sized amphibians that ruled the lakes and the rivers during the Triassic. If you were one of those small, little, early dinosaurs, you would want to stay far away from the lake shores and far away from the rivers because these things were there lurking. They ruled those ecosystems, but it was no better, no safer for those first dinosaurs on dry land because the Triassic was the heyday of the crocodile line archosaurs. And what I mean by that, is that today you have crocodiles. There's just about 25 species of crocs and alligators. They all kind of look the same. They all kind of live in the same places. They're tropical or subtropical. They live at that interface between water and land. But the modern diversity of crocodiles is nothing compared to the diversity of the crocodile group back in the Triassic. There were hundreds of these things. They lived all over the world. Some of them were top predators that had heads that looked like the heads of T-Rexes. Some of them were plant eaters. Some of them had armor and spikes covering their bodies. Some of them had sails on their back. Some of them walked on two legs. Some of them lost all of their teeth and grew beaks instead. It was these crocodile animals that were the dominant species on land, really for the entire Triassic. Now the dinosaurs were diversifying at this time, but it was really these crocodile line animals that were the ones that were succeeding. And if you could have gone back to the Triassic and surveyed the scene, I think if you had to guess which group of animals would eventually go on to evolve monstrous, enormous, colossal sizes or go on to start flying and go on to become dominant, you would guess it would be these crocodile line archosaurs, not the dinosaurs. But, of course, we know what happened. The crocs dwindled, the dinosaurs took over. And that, again, seems to have come down to a contingency, a bit of random dumb luck of Earth history. Because about 200 million years ago, as the Triassic period was ending, the supercontinent of Pangaea that these first dinosaurs were growing up on, that supercontinent began to break apart. And of course it did, of course it did. If it didn't, we wouldn't have separate continents today. Now, when Pangaea started to split, it began to unzip down its middle along what's now the Atlantic coast. So North America separated from Europe, South America from Africa. And today the Atlantic Ocean fills that gap. It marks that dividing line. But before water rushed in, 
the Earth bled lava. And there was another interval of time, this time about 600,000 years of more megavolcanoes, more lava, more greenhouse gases coming up, more global warming, another mass extinction. Not quite as bad as that one at the end of the Permian, but still one of the biggest five extinctions in Earth history. The crocs and the giant salamanders were some of the most notable victims of this extinction. They survived, but the crocs, for instance, they were truncated, they were decimated, they were reduced to just a handful of lineages, the ones that would eventually lead to modern crocs. Whereas dinosaurs, for some reason, they were the survivors. They sailed right on through the meat eaters, the plant eaters, the long neck dinosaurs, the early theropod dinosaurs, the major dinosaurs that were there in the Triassic, living in the shadows of those crocodile line animals, they made it through. And I wish I could tell you why the dinosaurs were the great survivors and not the crocs. I wish there was an easy answer. Maybe there is, but we don't know it yet. And I, I do think, and I tell this to my students all the time, uh, that this is the biggest mystery of dinosaur evolution that remains to be solved. Or at least to me, it's the most interesting mystery. And I have no doubt that some young student, a bright young new person in the field will figure this one out. And there are ideas out there. Maybe the dinosaurs grew faster. Maybe they were warm blooded. Maybe they had feathers. Maybe they could run faster. All different kinds of ideas so far, very difficult to test which of these, if any, were the overriding reason. But regardless of what that answer is, the pattern is clear. When Pangaea split and the volcanoes happened and it led to an extinction and the dinosaurs survived, afterwards, the Triassic turned to the Jurassic period and there's a reason that it's called Jurassic Park and not Triassic Park, because in the Jurassic is when the age of dinosaur dominance really began. This is when dinosaurs spread all around the world. This is when some dinosaurs evolved long necks and, and stupendous size and became the largest animals to ever live on land. This is when others, some meat eaters, started to become bigger than cars and then up to bus size. This is when others started to grow horns and spikes and frills and duckbills and dome heads and all of these fantastic features that make dinosaurs so fascinating to us. This all really started in earnest in the Jurassic. And it was in the Jurassic when the dinosaur family tree really started to grow. This is when so many of the, the most recognizable subgroups of dinosaurs got their start. And we're learning more and more about this all the time, especially now, because right now we are in the golden age of dinosaur research. We're finding more dinosaurs than ever before, at least we were before the pandemic canceled a lot of field work this year, but I'm sure this will just be a small blip because up until this year, for the last 15 years or so, on average, people have been finding somewhere around the world a totally new species of dinosaur once a week, once a week on average. So every year, there's 50 some new species of dinosaurs that are announced and they are being found all over the world. And to me, the reason for this is really clear. There's more people looking for dinosaurs than ever before. And it's a much more diverse group of people looking for dinosaurs than ever before. This is the Jurassic Park generation people of my age, and especially people that are younger, that were inspired by the film. And it's largely people growing up in these enormous developing countries that are building more museums, more universities. I'm talking about China, Argentina, Brazil, South Africa, to name just a few. It's not just little boys that become paleontologists anymore. Young women, many young women, and for those of you that know about our group in Edinburgh, it's dominated by young women, which is a wonderful thing. People from all over the world have come to Edinburgh to study with, with, with us, and that's true of, of so many paleontology labs these days. It's a great thing. More people than ever before all over the world out looking for dinosaurs, finding dinosaurs in many places where people used to think you would never find dinosaurs at all, including, believe it or not, right here in Scotland. <laughs> so. You might not believe it, but we do have dinosaurs here. Of course, some of you know that quite well. 
What you might not realize is that it was only in the 1980s, right around the time I was born, actually, that the very first dinosaur fossil was found in Scotland. And that was a single footprint that had fallen off a cliff on the one place where you can find good dinosaurs in Scotland. And that is this place, what I think is one of the most beautiful places in the world. And that's the Isle of Skye, this enchanted island, the set of so many big Hollywood blockbusters recently because it is such a gorgeous landscape. And this picture, I think, says it all. And it is an incredible privilege to be able to hunt for dinosaurs in a land that looks like this. Now, one of the great things about Sky, and we go there pretty much every year, uh, is that we can use it as a field laboratory to train our students. And uh, it, I mean this when I say it, it's not, um, it's not something I'm just making up. It's dead true that the best fossils, at least on our trips, are always found by the students. And I wish I could claim the best discoveries for myself, of course, like all fossil hunters, I'm competitive, I wanna find the best fossils, but all the time the students find the best stuff. And there's no better example of this than this moment here in the field. In the middle there is Amelia Penny, who did her PhD in Edinburgh with Rachel Wood a few years ago. Uh, and Amelia studied the origin of animals and the origin of skeletons. And she came to Sky with us really just for a little bit of a break. And lo and behold, what did she find? She found the skeleton of a pterosaur, of a pterodactyl at this spot right here. And uh, this is really an amazing fossil. We're working on it right now. I have a PhD student, Natalia Jelska, who uh, grew up in Poland and then uh, moved with her family uh, to Northern England. She's now in Scotland working with us and she's working on this fossil. She's presenting on it this year at Palace in just a few weeks. So stay tuned for Natalia's presentation there. But that's all I'll say about that because pterosaurs are not dinosaurs and we don't wanna get too sidetracked from our story. So anyway, so on the Isle of Skye, we bring our teams out, many of our students, uh, and we get to train our students uh, in, in field techniques. So this is a picture of Moji, who uh, did her, her uh, master's with us a, a few years ago. A and Moji studied the fossil fishes of the Jurassic rocks on the Isle of Skye. And so she's using an angle grinder to remove some of the little fish bones and fish teeth. She, she has to do that because the rocks are really hard. You can't use your hammers and your chisels here very easily because these rocks have been baked by volcanoes, more recent volcanoes. And so she's using this angle grinder to cut out the small bones. But when it comes to dinosaurs, we have to use bigger tools to get at the bigger bones. And here's our good friend, Doogie Ross, cutting out a dinosaur bone, literally sawing it out of a rock with the diamond tipped saw. And lucky for us, Doogie is a builder. So he has his own saws, he knows how to use them. And in fact, Doogie is such a builder that he built his own museum. He literally built it. He started collecting fossils and um, archeological artifacts when he was a teenager growing up on the Isle of Skye. And when he was quite young, he took the ruins of a one room 19th century schoolhouse, rebuilt it and turned it into what he called the Staffen Museum. And now that museum holds many of the most important fossils from Sky. And just a few years ago, Doogie was honored by the Paleontological Association with its Mary Anning Award for contributions from an amateur avocational paleontologist. So it's a joy to work with Doogie on his home island finding new dinosaurs. Okay, I could talk about Sky forever. I just wanna tell you one story of what I think has been one of our more interesting finds. And we made this uh, discovery a few years ago, about five years ago now, at the northeastern tip of the island at a place called Duntulum. And now I'm taking this picture not too far from the shadows of the ruins of a 14th century castle, a very Scottish experience. And you can see the sun is out. The sky is almost entirely blue. This is a rare thing for sky. So why are we not collecting fossils? Well, it's because the tide is high. The tide is right up to the beach. And so many of the sites on Sky, almost all of them really are along the coast. So we're always battling the tides. But when that beach is at low tide, it turns into a rock platform that juts out about 100 meters into those very cold waters of the North Atlantic. And several years back, John Hudson, our friend, who's the eminent expert on Hebridean geology, John mapped this area and he found a little bone. 
he found a tiny little bone and it turned out to be the jawbone of a crocodile that lived in an ancient lagoon. And so this got us very excited. We went to the site. We hoped we would maybe find a skeleton of one of these crocodiles, maybe even a dinosaur. We looked all day and we found nothing. It was just one of those days in the field, and these happen a lot more than we like to admit, where you just don't find anything. I mean, it's hard to find fossils. It's hard to find new things. And so about seven o'clock at night, you know, we figured it's time, pack up for the day, let's go get some dinner. So we started to walk back towards our vehicles. And I was walking with Tom Challens, who's uh, another paleontologist here in Edinburgh, who many of you know. Tom is a fossil fish expert in addition to many other things. And as we were walking, uh, we started to notice some holes in that rock platform, big holes, holes about the size of car tires. And at first we thought they were just little tidal pools and they were tidal pools. They were filled with seaweed and, and uh, barnacles and so on. But then we started to notice that, wait a minute, there was actually a lot of these things. There was more than a hundred of them on the rock platform. And they formed a bit of a sequence, a bit of a left, right, left, right, zigzagging sequence. And we could see them from the side. And we can see that these things were actually impressed into the rock. They couldn't just be random tidal erosion. They must have formed by something pressing into the soft sand or the mud before it was turned into a rock. And then some of these holes were filled with the harder rock and they stood out like pedestals. And we could see little bits sticking out, one, two, three, four. And sometimes we could see that these things were paired together and there was a bigger horseshoe shaped one with the smaller crescent shaped one in front. And these things were big, bigger than car tires. In fact, the biggest ones were. And after a few minutes, it dawned on Tom and me that, wait a minute, we've seen these things before, not on Sky, but in other places. And in fact, these things were fossils. <laughs> we had been silly. We had been so despondent that we didn't find anything. In fact, we had found something, but we hadn't found skeletons or bones or teeth we had found trace fossils, the footprints and handprints that were left by Jurassic aged animals. And there's really only one animal that ever lived, not only in the Jurassic, but ever in the entire history of the earth on the land that was so big that it would make a hole the size of a car tire every time its hand or foot touched the ground. And we're talking, of course, about the sauropod dinosaurs, the brontosaurus or diplodocus type dinosaurs with their long necks and tiny heads and pot bellies and columnar limbs. And these were the dinosaurs that later on after the Jurassic in the Cretaceous would evolve into colossuses that were bigger than Boeing 737 aircraft, the biggest things to ever live on land. The ones making their tracks on sky, though, were among the wave of the first giant sauropods to spread around the world. And we're talking about things that were the size of a few elephants put together that could stretch their necks a couple of stories into the sky. Now, the more we look on sky, the more we find other tracks, and not just of the giant sauropods, but also of meat eaters and plate-back dinosaurs and duck-billed dinosaurs, all kinds of things. And again, it's student research that is leading a lot of this effort. And this is Paige DiPolo, who's doing her PhD now in Edinburgh. She's actually studying mammals with us. We have a big active group studying the early evolution of placental mammals, topic for another day. But Paige first came to Edinburgh to do a master's in our master's program. And lucky for us, Paige not only has a background in geology, but also in engineering. So she's very good at building contraptions and instruments and running experiments and so on. Uh, so Paige started to use drones to map these track sites, and she's mapped a lot of these sites, and, and, and they, they give us a lot of information. They help us to paint this sort of picture of what the world looked like back then. And this is an artwork that's been done by John Hode, who's one of the world's great paleo artists, and he's from right here in Scotland, just up the road in Perth. John is a master at setting the scene, and what he's showing here is a few of these giant sauropods venturing into one of the Jurassic lagoons right after a storm looking for food. We can tell from the rocks and from the maps that Paige made that these sauropods were actually wading in shallow water when they made their tracks. So this is one possibility of why they were there. Now you can see in this image that there's another type of dinosaur in the foreground. And this is a smaller dinosaur. And this is a dinosaur that's walking only on its hind legs. And if you could zoom in, you can see it has sharp little teeth 
So this is a theropod dinosaur, one of the meat eaters. And in fact, this type of dinosaur we think is an early relative of T. rex, the great T. rex. Now what we know for sure is that in other places in the world, a little bit later in the Jurassic, there were definite bona fide primitive tyrannosaurs. And this is the best example. This is called Guanlong from China. Now I should say that the sky fossils are about 170 million years old. They're from right in the middle of the Jurassic period. And it's just slightly after that time that we see these unequivocal early tyrannosaurs in other parts of the world. And maybe they lived here in Scotland too, we just don't have enough fossils yet to prove it. We know there were meat-eating dinosaurs, we know they left their footprints, we have a few bones and teeth, but not enough to make a definitive ID. But in China, for instance, there are complete skeletons of this early tyrannosaur called Guanlong. And it's from this type of animal, just about the size of a human, just about my size, that the great T-Rex evolved from. So over time, tyrannosaurs got bigger, much, much bigger, and you might wonder why. Well, we have a new clue from another unexpected place, Uzbekistan, this vast country in Central Asia, which actually has great potential for future discoveries. And a few years back, my colleague Sasha Avaranov in Russia and Hans Dieter Seuss in the US, they led a fieldwork trip to Uzbekistan and they found this bone, which is actually a fused mass of bones from the back of the head of a dinosaur. And you're looking at it from the back. This hole is where the spinal cord goes into the brain cavity. And this is one of many bones of a new tyrannosaur that they found, which we described together a few years ago. We called it Timurlengia. It comes from after the Jurassic in the Cretaceous. So it's basically in age, it's between the oldest tyrannosaurs and T. rex, which lived at the very end of the Cretaceous, right at the end of the age of dinosaurs. And it's also intermediate in size. It's about the size of a horse. So it falls in between those human-sized first tyrannosaurs and the double-decker bus-sized T. rexes. Now, what's interesting about Timurlengia is that we can put that skull in a CAT scanner. And this is Ian Butler, my colleague in Edinburgh. He's a geochemist, but he's also a great builder of machines. And he built his own scanner, which is in the basement uh, of our institute, the Grant Institute. And Ian scanned this skull, and we were able to use software to digitally reconstruct the inside parts of it through those scans. And that allows us to see what the brain and the sinuses and the ear and other structures of this tyrannosaur look like. And what you're seeing there in blue is the back end of the brain of this tyrannosaur. And that thing that looks like a pretzel in pink is the inner ear. Now, long story short, this is a big brain for a horse-sized dinosaur. And also we can tell from the length of the cochlea of the ear, the bit that's sticking down from the pretzel, that it could hear a wide range of sounds. We know that because in modern animals, the longer the cochlea, the wider range of sound. What this means is that tyrannosaurs were evolving bigger brains, higher intelligence, keener senses, while they were still relatively small probably to survive in some of those niches when they were still being lorded over by other giant dinosaurs, allosaurs and spinosaurs and so on. So what made T. rex truly special really is that it descended from animals that had already evolved keen intelligence and sharp senses. So when some of those other giant dinosaurs that were incumbent in the top predator niches started to die off later in the Cretaceous, those brainy horse-sized tyrannosaurs took advantage and that's where T-Rex came from. They took over those niches. And so what makes T-Rex really, really special is not just that it's huge. Of course, it's huge. Everybody knows it's huge. It's one of the biggest predators to ever live on land in the history of the earth. It is the size of a double-decker bus. Its head was the size of a bathtub. It did have over 50 railroad spike teeth that could crush through the bones of its prey. That's all true. But it wasn't only brawny, it was also brainy. And it was that combination that made it the ultimate dinosaur predator. Now, tyrannosaurs over time got bigger, but there was another group of meat-eating dinosaurs that did the opposite. They took the reverse journey. They got smaller and smaller over time. And what I'm talking about here are the raptor dinosaurs, the ones like Velociraptor itself. 
And what you see in this piece of art, this is by Todd Marshall, another of the world's great paleo artists who illustrated my book. What Todd shows here is what the real Velociraptor would have looked like. We're not totally sure about the colors, although we can tell the colors of dinosaurs in some cases. But we know the real Velociraptor was nothing like it's shown in Jurassic Park. The real Velociraptor would not have been green and scaly and drab colored. The real Velociraptor had feathers and it even had wings. And we know this because of actual fossils, not only of Velociraptor, but of many other dinosaurs. And the best of these are found in northeastern China in a place called Liaoning, in this unassuming landscape close to the border with North Korea, way tucked up there, a land of factories and a land of farms and rolling hills. And it was in the mid 90s that farmers started to find fossils like these when they were out working their land. Dinosaurs skeletons of dinosaurs. Not only the bones, but those skeletons there are sheathed in feathers. Dinosaurs covered in feathers. Now the first of these was found a few years after the Jurassic Park film came out, so Mr. Spielberg would have been silly to put feathers on his dinosaurs before these fossils were found, so he wins a reprieve there. Uh, I'm now the science consultant for Jurassic World, so I just say stay tuned. Uh, as those of you who are um, on the pulse of these things know, Colin Trevorrow, the director, has already announced some of the new animals that will be appearing in the next film, which will come out in the summer of 2022. And so we're doing our best to get the, you know, the latest science in, in, in the next films. But in any case, when the first Jurassic Park came out, they didn't know dinosaurs had feathers. Now we do, and now we know that many dinosaurs had feathers. It was not a rare thing. These fossils from China, are probably the most important dinosaurs, certainly that have been found in my lifetime, maybe in even the last century. They tell the story of how feathers evolved and how flight evolved and how birds evolved. The first thing they do is they tell us for sure, definitively birds evolved from dinosaurs. There used to be a debate, but once you find feathers on dinosaur fossils, it's case closed. So birds evolved from dinosaurs, but how they did it is really interesting. These Chinese fossils, tell us that many dinosaurs had feathers. Many meat eaters did, but also some plant eaters. Small dinosaurs did, but there are even fossils of nine meter long tyrannosaurs from China covered in feathers. But the feathers of most dinosaurs were simple. They looked like this. And what you see in this picture are a couple of tail bones of a primitive tyrannosaur. And those things above the tail bones that look like little scratches in the rock, those things are feathers. But again, simple feathers, individual little strands. They would have looked much more like hair, the hair that we have, than the feathers of modern birds. Now that's how most dinosaurs kept their feathers. And it goes without saying, but these dinosaurs couldn't fly with those kind of feathers any more than we can fly with our hair. That's ridiculous. So feathers must have first evolved as simple structures probably to help keep these dinosaurs warm, the same reason mammals evolved hair. And again, most dinosaurs kept it that way, except one group of dinosaurs started to do something different with their feathers as their bodies were getting smaller, and these were the raptors. They started to pack those feathers ever more tightly all over their bodies. They started to line up those feathers on their arms. Those feathers got longer. Those feathers started to branch out. They started to flatten out until you see raptor dinosaurs that have full-on wings with quill pen type feathers attached to the arm and to the hand in the same position, the same orientation, the same layout as the wings of birds today. And this is a prime example of a raptor dinosaur with a wing, and it comes from this dinosaur right here. It is not a bird because it could not fly, and it doesn't fall within the bird group on the family tree, but in fact, it's a very close relative of Velociraptor. And I had the privilege to study this dinosaur and to describe it a few years back with my dear and sadly dearly departed colleague, Jun Chang Lu, one of China's great dinosaur hunters who passed a couple years ago. Jun Chang and I here are looking at this fossil, the most gorgeous fossil I've ever seen. Those chocolate brown bones just seem to levitate out of that cream colored limestone. And those bones are surrounded with feathers. There's feathers on the tail. There's feathers on the body and there's feathers on the arms making wings. There's one wing and there's the other wing. That's the one from a few slides ago. There it is, a raptor dinosaur with wings. 
Now, if you saw a Gen Wan long alive, you probably would have been faced with an animal like this. And I think if you saw this thing alive, you would consider it a bird. No weirder than a turkey or an emu or an ostrich, but we don't call it a bird because it couldn't fly. That's basically it. There's a phylogenetic part of that definition too. But Gen 1 long had feathers, it had wings, but its wings were too small to keep an animal of its size in the air. It was about the size of a St. Bernard, you know, a large dog, something like that. And in fact, the first wings in the dinosaur fossil record show up on horse-sized dinosaurs, but those wings are no bigger than my laptop screen here. No way those things could keep an animal in the air. So those first wings probably evolved for display as advertising billboards sticking out of the arms of some of these dinosaurs. But then you can imagine, as these dinosaurs got smaller and smaller and those advertising billboards got bigger and bigger, at some point, one of those dinosaurs would start moving their arms around and by the simple laws of physics, that billboard could create a little bit of lift, a little bit of thrust. And as you can imagine, it wouldn't take evolution very much to take an animal like Gen 1 long, make it a little bit smaller, make its wings a little bit bigger, and turn it into something like Archaeopteryx, the first true bird in the fossil record, which had wings that were big enough and powerful enough that when it flapped those wings, it could keep itself up in the air. And it's at this point that we say birds evolved. And this is how birds evolved from dinosaurs. Incredible story. Now, a lot of people still try to argue with me, and I'm sure those of you that teach courses on dinosaurs or just talk about dinosaurs to your family, to your friends, you often get this pushback. Okay, birds evolved from dinosaurs, but they're so different than dinosaurs, we should call them something else. We shouldn't say they are dinosaurs. And my retort to that argument is always showing a picture like this. This is, of course, not a bird, <laughs> not a dinosaur. This is a bat. This is a bat, another animal that could fly. Now, bats are mammals. Of course, bats are mammals. Nobody would argue with that. Bats have hair. Bats feed their young with milk. Bats have molars and premolars and the, the whole suite of mammalian teeth. Bats are a type of mammal. They're just a strange type of mammal that got small, evolved wings, and developed the ability to fly. But they're mammals nonetheless. They're part of the mammal family tree. And birds are the dinosaur version of that. They're a strange type of dinosaur that got smaller, evolved wings, and develop the ability to fly. And what that means is that in our world today, there are still over 10,000 species of dinosaurs, including majestic things like our bald eagle here. I'm prouder of our bald eagle now that the way the election went, <laughs> I'll put it that way. But our bald eagle, a majestic bird, a majestic dinosaur, some not so majestic at all. And this, of course, is a gull, one of those nasty, nasty little jerks that you confront at the seaside that come down and try to dive bomb you and steal your chips and steal your ice cream. And it's a nuisance. It's, it's annoying, I mean, a little bit terrifying these birds. But when they do this, when they behave this way, I think you can sense the inner velociraptor inside a seagull. And that's because they are dinosaurs. Birds are dinosaurs. And they survive today as part of our world. But no other dinosaurs do. And that's because as the Jurassic turned into the Cretaceous and the Cretaceous marched on and the continents continued to move apart from each other, the dinosaurs found themselves in a world like this 66 million years ago in the very last day of the Cretaceous. There were still dinosaurs living all over the world, different ones on different continents. It was the heyday of their diversity. But then one random Tuesday evening, let's say, this six mile wide asteroid fell out of the sky, was traveling faster than a speeding bullet. It smashed into the earth with the force of over 1 billion nuclear bombs put together. It punched a hole in the crust in what is now Mexico, over 100 miles wide. And within an instant, it unleashed a chain reaction of chaos that reshaped the world forever. Wildfires, tsunamis, earthquakes, hurricane force winds, all that stuff happened in the moments and the hours and the days afterwards. But then there was all the junk that was kicked up into the atmosphere from the explosion that went around the world. It covered the earth in darkness, a nuclear winter that lasted many years, maybe even a few decades. And that 
meant that plants didn't have sunlight to make their own food. Photosynthesis couldn't happen. Forests and other ecosystems collapsed like houses of cards. And then even longer term, over the course of a few thousand years, global winter, nuclear winter, switched to global warming because of all the carbon dioxide that was kicked up from that explosion. So you have this catastrophe of unimaginable scale. It was the worst single day in the history of the Earth, I'm convinced, and it led to many thousands of years of pain. Dinosaurs were there to see it. T-Rex itself was there the day the asteroid hit. So was Triceratops. So were herds of duck-billed dinosaurs. And they did not make it through. A few birds did. Actually, most birds died, but a few birds made it through. But all the other dinosaurs were gone. And now, as my research continues, I'm becoming increasingly fascinated with what happened after the asteroid. What lived, what died, how quickly it took the Earth to recover, and what sort of new world was forged out of the fire. And so I've started to spend a lot of time in New Mexico, one of the best places in the world that has a record, layer by layer, rock layers full of fossils spanning the late Cretaceous, past the asteroid impact into the next interval of time called the Paleocene. Now this does look a lot more like those stereotypical fossil fields that you see on TV. This is desert, this is badlands, and it is chock full of fossils. And you can actually go up through the rocks. You can see dinosaur bones falling out of the rocks in the Cretaceous, and then suddenly they disappear. You never find a single shard of a dinosaur bone again, and they're replaced by a new type of fossil. Now, we've been collecting these for a while. I work with Tom Williamson, who's the world expert on these rocks and their fossils. Tom's been working there for about a quarter century. He's collected tens of thousands of fossils. And we've started to train a lot of our own students. Sarah Shelley was my first PhD student, and Sarah is now uh, an eminent expert on the animals that took over from the dinosaurs. In fact, she's going to be the author on a nature paper that comes out soon, which I'm insanely proud of as a supervisor. I'm not involved with that, by the way. That's uh, her postdoc, came out of her postdoc, but she's coming back to Edinburgh to do a postdoc to work with our growing team that Paige is a part of. And also I have uh, other PhD students, Zoe and Sophia and Hans, that are all working on the animals that took over from the dinosaurs, the animals that left their fossils in New Mexico. The fossils look like this. These things might look familiar to you because all of us, or at least most of us, have these things inside our own mouths. These are teeth, and these are the classic molar and premolar teeth of mammals. So it was mammals, of course, that survived the extinction and took over from the dinosaurs, along with some birds and some lizards and turtles and so on. Now, within a few hundred thousand years at most in New Mexico, we see all kinds of new mammals diversifying, and they're getting much bigger, and they're evolving new diets and new ways of moving. And within a few million years of the asteroid, we see fossils of this creature, a small animal just about the size of a house cat, long, gangly arms and legs, a humble creature, and it had opposable thumbs. It could grip the branches. And this it was a primate, one of the very first primates, a distant cousin of ours. And if that asteroid never hit, these sorts of animals would have never had the chance to evolve. So I think that goes to show how the story of dinosaurs is really the story of us. All of this is related. This is all one great tale of evolution. And if that asteroid was a near miss, 66 million years ago on that Tuesday evening. And the dinosaurs lived on as more than just birds, but as T-Rexes and Triceratopses that continued to evolve and go their own ways. Primates probably would have never gotten their chance, and therefore we probably would not have either. So this is all connected as all one great grand story of life, and we learn more about it with each new fossil that we find. So I will end there and just say thank you to all of my colleagues and my funders, and especially my students. I'd say the only student I haven't mentioned yet here, a PhD student, is Julia because she studies Crocs. <laughs> it doesn't fit into the story here. But a big thanks to everybody who works with me, Mark Young, Ornella Bertrand, Greg Funston, who are my excellent postdocs now, all of our master's students, all of my colleagues in Edinburgh, Rachel Wood, Dick Kroon, Sean McMahon, an incredible team of paleontologists, my friends at the National Museum, Nick Frazier and Stig Walsh, 
and their colleagues, Neil Clark in Glasgow. I could go on and on, but I'm so fortunate to be part of both a Scottish community that has welcomed me with open arms and a global community of people like me that are obsessed with fossils. So thank you very much. And I look forward to any questions that uh, we have in the next 30 minutes or whatever we have until I have to go down and put my 13 month old to bed. So thank you all. Great, thank you very much, Steve. That was an absolutely fascinating uh, lecture. Uh, we've got quite a lot of um, attendees on YouTube as well as those joining us on Zoom. So I'm gonna open the floor to questions from, from all of you. If you're joining us on Zoom, if you could please pop a message in the uh, Zoom chat and I will unmute you to ask a question uh, or, or just wave on the screen. Um, and if you're joining us on YouTube, please pop the questions into the live chat and I will put them directly to Steve. All right, sounds good. Yeah, so um, I, I can't see anybody initially on the Zoom chat, so I'll start with a question from John Clayton on YouTube. Um, that is, I know that fossils are rare, but is there a missing link fossil which you would really like and expect to find to fill a gap in our knowledge? Well, uh, you know, we're always looking for fossils that can um, either test, you know, particular hypotheses about evolution or that fill a gap in um, maybe a sequence or, or a gap in a story that we're trying to put together. Um, you know, we're spending a lot of time in New Mexico looking for these first placental mammals that were really blossoming after the dinosaur extinction. So we're always looking for newer and older mammals. But the one thing that would be amazing to find would be the Archaeopteryx version of a pterosaur. So I, I know I was supposed to be talking about dinosaurs and stuff, but you know we have all these feathered dinosaurs that show us how birds evolved from dinosaurs, kind of step by step. We don't have that with pterosaurs. So the fossil that Amelia found on Sky uh, is a full-blown pterosaur. You know, it's got its wings, its big wings, and so on. It could fly really well. We don't really have the precursors of those animals. These pterosaurs just appear in the fossil record. So somewhere, somebody will probably find one one day. We have some fossils in Scotland that could be part of that story from up in Elgin. Uh, the problem is there's things like um, Scleromacholus uh, that maybe could have something to do with the origin of pterosaurs. Really hard to tell. The fossils are pretty poorly preserved, but my former PhD student Davide Fofa is doing a postdoc now at the National Museum here in town, and he's CT scanning those fossils. So I think that's going to give us a lot of new insight, and maybe this Scottish thing will be the, the uh, pterosaur archaeopteryx. So stay tuned to Davide's work for that. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I'm going to hand over to Leslie to ask a question to you. Hi, hi, Steve. Um, thank you. You made me go and dig out my... Ah, oh, from Portugal. Portugal. Yes. Yeah. Very nice. I thought when you were talking about Portugal, I'd better get that out. But what, what I wanted to ask about is um, what impact on research does indiscriminate fossil collecting have? Because I'm aware that on Sky at the moment, there's a nature conservation order to prevent fossil collecting. And obviously, you know, if they're taking away stuff, that's going to affect your research. And I wondered what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I'm very pleased with, um, you know, how, how things have developed, developed on Sky with the nature conservation order. Um, Doogie Ross and Neil Clark and Nick Fraser and I and others, you know, played our part in, in helping um, Scottish Natural Heritage get that order together. And there's some nice signposts on the major sites on Sky now that tell people what the rules are. Um, you know, there have been things on Sky that have been uh, illegally collected, that have been damaged. In most cases, those are people that just haven't known the rules. But there have been some cases where bad actors have tried to take something, uh, including one very nice dinosaur skeleton, sadly. Um, that was pretty much smashed to pieces. And, and for those of you that know Sky, we don't really have a lot of skeletons. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of footprints and individual bones. So that's a tragic tale there. Um, and it's irreplaceable. It's a problem in many places. Um, you know, the, the, the topic of fossil collecting and commercial fossil collecting and so on is a big topic and one that would, you know, take it many <laughs> days of discussion to get down pat. Every, what I'll say though is every country sometimes even different provinces and states have their own laws. And the most important thing is to follow the laws, know the laws and follow the laws. 
when I was a teenager, I really got into paleontology first through reading all my brother's books on dinosaurs, but then by going out, you know, when I got my driver's license back home in the U.S., going out and taking my, you know, parents' car and going out to collect brachiopods and corals and bryozoans and so on. I mean, there is nothing more intoxicating than going out and being the first person to find this thing that's 290 million years old. And, and I tell that to people all the time that ask me, how can I get involved in the field? Go out and find your own fossils if you can, but know the laws, always know the laws. <laughs> okay. Great, thanks. I'll hand over to um, John Beatty to ask our next question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Steve, the, the, the primates that uh, you discovered, the, the post-dinosaur bones, was there, was there any trace of them while the dinosaurs were actually still, still treading the earth? That's a great question, John. It's a big debate actually about when placental mammals, so mammals like us that give live birth to well-developed young, when placental mammals evolved, did they evolve alongside the dinosaurs or did they spring up right after the extinction? They almost certainly evolved with the dinosaurs. And there's a lot of genetic evidence that I think has closed the case there. But now the debate has kind of shifted to, did some of the major groups of placental mammals like primates get their start in the Cretaceous, in a dinosaur world, and then survived the extinction and prospered afterwards. I don't know the answer to that question. That's one of the big things we're trying to work on with our, our mammal research group now, um, you know, with many of the people that, that I mentioned in the talk. We're building a huge family tree of early mammals, and we're putting these um, mammals that lived with the dinosaurs in the context of the mammals that came later. And we're dating that tree using fossils and so on. We're including anatomical data and also molecular data for modern species. Uh, so I think the answer to that still is, is to come. So I'm very excited to see what that answer will be. And I don't know the answer, at least not yet. Thanks, Steve. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a question from um, Amy Potts, also on our Zoom meeting. Just ask you to unmute, Amy. Um, so, admittedly, coming from someone who hasn't actually studied paleontology, but very interested, were there insects around sort of before, you know, the dinosaur extinction event? And what happened during that extinction event between two insects but, um, during that time? Great question, Amy. I'm not going to probably be able to give you a very good answer because insects are so far out of my specialty. There's a great insect expert at the National Museum here, Andy Ross, who I'm sure he could tell you the exact answer to that question. Um, what I do know is insects evolved a long time ago. The first insects are many hundreds of millions of years old. And in fact, you know, back in the coal swamp days, uh, you know, long before the dinosaurs, not only were there insects, but there were giant insects, giant um, dragonflies and so on that were living in those worlds. And even before then, you know, in, in some of the fossils from Scotland, the Rhiney shirt, which is the first really good terrestrial ecosystem in the fossil record, you have a lot of little arthropods. I don't know if they're technically insects. I don't know for sure what kind of arthropods, but you have little buggy things that are there. So they were some of the first things along with plants that, you know, colonize the land. Uh, there were plenty of insects that lived with the dinosaurs. I, I, I do know that. Um, it seems like there was a diversification of insects in the Cretaceous alongside the diversification of flowering plants, as would make sense because we know today so many insects pollinate flowering plants. And those plants only got their start in the Cretaceous. A brontosaurus would have never seen a flower, which is an amazing thing to think about. Um, and then a lot of those insects had to survive the extinction. I don't know if the rates of extinction, what they were like. Um, presumably they were hit pretty hard, but I don't know. You know, I'm not quite sure. So um, that's as much as I can tell you. And I, I guess I'll just say maybe, uh, you know, go and do some web searches and some reading and see if you can figure out the rest of the story and then let me know, send me an email. Thank you very much. Um, great, thank you. Um, there's quite a few questions on YouTube looking at uh, or asking about diversity and the evolution of the dinosaurs. So I'll just put this one um, from Matthew Status. What is the relationship between dinosaur diversity and temperature and do they uh, do better during the warmer or cooler intervals of the Mesozoic? So good question, Matthew. Matthew's one of our 
uh, excellent master's students who's just started in this, <laughs> this most remarkable of years to jump into a master's. Uh, Matthew's doing a really cool project on some of the microfossils that lived in the ocean when the dinosaurs, uh, kind of during the dinosaur extinction time. So all of you out here watch for Matthew's work uh, in the next few years. Um, I, it's a good question, Matthew. We should talk about that in one of our paleo group meetings. Um, there have been some studies that have looked at long-term trends in dinosaur evolution with things like sea level and temperature. People like um, Richard Butler and Roger Benson and, and, and their group looked into some of those topics. Um, as far as I recall, there's, there's not a really tight relationship between dinosaur diversity and temperature. At the same time, you know, you're looking at very coarse level uh, comparisons, like over, you know, time bins of many millions of years. So I think, I think that is a very open question. Um, when it comes to mammals, though, I can tell you, I mean, there's much of mammal evolution has been driven by changes in temperature. When you talk about things like the Paleocene thermal maximum spread of more modern style placental mammals or the cold snap that started at the Oligocene and then it led to the opening of grasslands and evolution of grazers and so on. So I would think similar things might have happened with dinosaurs, but we might just not have the resolution of the fossil record yet to know it. Or maybe there's literature out there that I just uh, have, have missed or forgotten about. So that's one we should look into. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to hand over to Roy Plotnick on um, Zoom to ask the next question. Hi, first of all, this is the Orlando Smith road cut behind me. I love it, I love it. <laughs> this is where he, his very first paper, I think, was done on that. Yes, um, I was wondering about the, hold on a second, I gotta, somebody, we get the phone call here. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, I was wondering about the, your your thoughts on the recent revision of the higher level taxonomy of the dinosaurs. You're changing the, the classic ornithischian saurischian division. Yeah, great question, Roy. And, you know, many of you probably know Roy, but eminent professor in Chicago, and Roy knows the places I'm talking about well, like the one in his background where I did, when I did get my driver's license and went out to collect fossils, it's places like that in, in Northern Illinois. And Roy has been instrumental in, in getting some of these sites preserved now and protected, especially this one very important quarry. Um, to your question, Roy, um, the dinosaur family tree, there have been some big revisions recently. The biggest one was the one that was published a few years ago by Barron et al. in Nature that uh, moved the, the ornithischian dinosaurs, the bird hip dinosaurs, um, next to theropods. So the classic idea was that the meat-eating theropods, the long-necked sauropods formed their own sister group called the saurischians, and then the ornithischians were outside of that. In effect, they reshuffled the cards and they put the ornithischians with the theropods, with the sauropods outside. I was part of a response to that uh, article that was led by Max Langer, who's the great Brazilian expert on early dinosaurs. And we looked in detail at that data set and, and we had a lot of, you know, differences of opinion with the way characters were scored. And when we scored things the way that we favored them, uh, the, the traditional view came out. So I still think the weight of evidence is on the traditional view. However, um, it doesn't take much, as, as those of you that know, you know phylogenetics <laughs> would attest, it doesn't take much to really change things. It can be a few characters here and there. So I think it's really kind of an open question as to what the relationships are of the earliest dinosaurs. I, I think it's far from settled. Um, if I had to put money on it, I'd put money on the traditional view, but uh, you know, I could very easily be wrong. So. What we need now are just, well, as always, more fossils, and there are a lot of more fossils of early dinosaurs coming out, particularly of Brazil and Argentina, but also just new people, younger people, fresh eyes, looking at the evidence and, and taking a, a new look at it. So open question. Great, thank you very much, Steve. Um, I'll take one more question from, from YouTube before we um, hand over back to the president. Um, so this is from Amy, um, from Amy. Do you believe that certain theropod dinosaurs might have had similar sexual dichromatic feather displays that birds do today? Um, apparently Amy's doing a project on, on this, so be interested to know. That's cool, Amy, that's a good question. I, I Probably, I suspect, yeah, I think so. I think we know through the work of, you know, people who have pioneered the, the discovery of melanosomes, fossil melanosomes and dinosaur feathers to tell color, you know, people like Jakob Vinther, and uh, Maria McNamara and you know many of their colleagues um, 
what they've shown is that there is incredible diversity in, in the handful of dinosaurs that have been studied so far. There's so many different feather colors, black and brown and white and ginger and there's camouflage patterns and ring patterns and iridescence and all kinds of things. So it looks like that dinosaurs did a lot of stuff with their feathers that birds do today, which would make me think that those sort of displays, sexual displays or di dimorphic displays would be things that, that some dinosaurs would do. I don't think there's any evidence for it yet. There isn't some actual Mesozoic birds, I believe, like Confucius Ornus, but I don't think there's any non-bird dinosaur where that's been shown. I might be wrong, um, but maybe, you know, given the large number of things like Microraptor and Inky Ornus fossils from China, it's the kind of thing that maybe could actually be tested. So I think that's a really cool thing to look into. Great, thank you very much, Steve. I'm gonna hand back now to um, our, to NIMI president, Steve Martin. Uh, I've just asked you to unmute, Steve. Yes, well, thank you, Steve. That was an absolutely brilliant lecture. It gave me so much to think about myself, but I'm going to pass you on here because uh, I know Fiona Gill is going to give you uh, a vote of thanks on behalf of all of us, which would be so much probably much, so much better than I could give. So Fiona, can I hand across to you? Thanks, Steve. And it's it's my pleasure tonight to, to thank um, our speaker, Steve, for such a fascinating talk on the rise and fall of the dinosaurs. And Steve has really taken us on an amazing journey through 200 million years of geological time and all around the world, from Poland to Portugal, China, Uzbekistan, and of course, Scotland. Um, and it really was a, a fascinating story of dinosaur evolution. Um, personally, I, I especially enjoyed hearing about the importance of uh, dinosaur footprints and other trace fossils in unravelling the story of dinosaur evolution. And of course, hearing about and seeing the images of, of the amazing feathered dinosaurs from China. And I was also really fascinated to hear about the brain and the ear structure of the ancestors of T-Rex. And as well as telling the story of the rise and fall of the dinosaurs, what I especially liked about Steve's talk tonight was that he managed to, to weave in the stories of the people who find and work on dinosaurs and other fossils. And it was fantastic to see the diversity of people who were working with fossils. Um, so I would just like to finish by thanking Steve for giving us such a great talk tonight and for being a fantastic ambassador for paleontology. So I'd like to invite everybody to um, show their appreciation in the usual manner, please. Thanks. And thanks to all of you.